our next speaker, Sadie Lincoln. She is the powerful businesswoman behind International Bar 3 Fitness Franchise, and she's gonna talk about how she's working to redefine success in the fitness industry. And you definitely wanna take this class, and I just will warn you now, beware when they tell you you're gonna do rocking horse, because it's really hard. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Uh, thank you. So where's my slideshow here? Okay, good. There awesome. Go. And then you can just use that again. Thank you. And then this goes that way. Yeah. This goes that way. Okay, got it. Um, wow, I, I'm so um, just filled with so many emotions right now. Um, so I, it would be a blessing in a way to go first, but also it's um, really amazing because I, I feel like I'm processing all of your stories right now and to get up here and tell my, my own is like, I'm just gonna try to pull it all together. Um, because I'm, I hear myself in all of your stories, I really do. Um, and especially Courtney's. Um, so I wasn't planning this, but I'm gonna tell you my pee story because I'm gonna out pee you. <laughs> I, this has no relevance to my talk, but I have to share it. Uh, I was in the Portland airport and I had this really killer bucket bag, you know, the kind that doesn't zip at the top. It's super cute, went with the outfit, I was really feeling good. I had my rolly. My uh, flight was boarding, but I ran into the bathroom, I'm like, I'm just gonna go pee real quick, I really had to go pee. And it was one of those moments when like, it was a transition, so there's tons of people in the bathroom, like waiting in line, like you're waiting, 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 and the stall doors are opening and closing, opening and closing. And I went in and I got in there and I shut the door and I put my um, rollie against the door with my bucket bag on top of it. Okay, so I'll try to show you. I haven't told very many people this story. Okay, so the door is shut, my rollie's right here, my bucket bag is open, right? And the door, this door goes out, okay? So then I pull down my jeans and I'm not touching the toilet, so I'm like this, midstream, I kid you not. The bucket bag and rolly fall forward, the door opens, my bucket bag opens, and all my shit falls out into the middle. And I was like, at least I don't know who I am, but then I heard this big clink, 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 it was my bar three water bottle just like clanking down the, but I'm midstream. So I get up, and I'm like, stop peeing, stop peeing, but I couldn't stop peeing. So I was like, out in the middle, picking up my shit, peeing with my ass showing, and a bunch of women, I'm just like, shit, shit, shit. And I went back in and I shut the door. And then I was like, are you kidding me? I, there is pee all along the floor, down my pants, and I'm shaking. And I got all my shit in my bag, but then I was like, I, my plan, I'm just gonna like, grab a bunch of toilet paper, I tried to mop it up. And I was just like, no eye contact, no eye contact. <laughs> and raise and like wash my hands as fast as I could. And the lucky thing is my plane was boarding so I didn't have to hang out and see these people ever again. Um, and I have a vague memory of like, no one laughed. Like it is funny, it was so horrific. It wasn't even funny at the time, you know, when it's that bad. And I heard this one woman go, oh. <laughs> I think I out you. You did. Okay. Um, <laughs> it, I was trying to figure out how this relates to my talk, and in, in a way it does, because um, my journey has been about trying to be successful, trying to get there, um, and figuring out what success really means. And for me, it's been rooted to the fitness industry, because as a young woman, I grew up in an alternative family. I was raised by like a pack of women, basically. My mom and her four best friends were all single and they raised us kids together. So I grew up with five moms and um, one of them just passed away. So I'm like, whew, um, Guy Althree knows that. But I have thought a lot about um, the power of sitting in circle because we used to grow up sitting in circle as a family. And what drew these women together was their love of dream work and inner awareness and looking inside for answers. And I grew up in this beautiful environment where I had a group of women who weren't even related to me and their children always believing in me, even when I sucked, even when I didn't make the grade, um, when maybe I didn't think I was lovable, they always reaffirmed that I was. And 
I also grew up with a gift of looking inside for answers and trusting my intuition, and that certainly served me my whole life. And even with that amazing upbringing, which we, if we could all be so lucky, right? It's a beautiful way to be raised. I was still conditioned to believe I was not enough and that this, what you see on the outside, mattered more than what was going on on the inside. And I struggled with this from a very young age. I remember um, taking a shower as a teenager and standing in front of the mirror and like wishing away from here to here, wishing away my, my body parts because I used to back then pour over the Victoria's Secret catalogs. Did anyone ever get those? And I was like, this is sexy. This is worthy. This is, this is achievement. And then I'd look at myself in the mirror and I'm like, one boob's this way, one boob's that way. I have no waist. I have no butt. Like everything to me was wrong, right? And it was before filters. So I would like squint my eyes and like squeeze and pull and try to like suck and lift and like try to look different to, to fit that image. And that's when I discovered fitness and this promise that if I worked out, then I could be fabulous. I could look like them. Then I could be successful. I could be worthy. And that idea really intrigued me. And I did fall in love with fitness and um, I ended up making it my career. And I, uh, for my entire professional career, I own a company called Bar3 now, which is a fitness company. And I've been a part of this incredible industry. I think fitness was basically invented in 1980. Like, that's when it came to us as a product and a service and a promise to get better. Um, and that's when we became educated as a nation that yes, fitness is important for our health um, and well-being. And it's scientifically proven it, it is important. Um, and it's been a booming industry since then. Um, just in the last 10 years, fitness has grown 5% year over year. It's a $30 billion industry. Um, it has survived recessions. It is a really strong, viable business. Uh, and we've made progress in that most of us in America know the benefits of fitness. Um, we know that and we've kind of won the hearts and minds of people. It's not about education anymore. And it's not about accessibility. Fitness is everywhere and it's growing and growing and growing. So why is our health declining? When I was at 24 Hour Fitness for 11 years, um, I worked in the corporate headquarters and had the opportunity to uh, I worked for the founder and CEO, Mark Mastroff, who continues to be one of my mentors. But uh, I had the opportunity to sit in a lot of meetings and learn from consulting firms and data about um, fitness and then also how we were doing as a nation. And it was so alarming to me that while the fitness industry was booming, our health was on the decline. Since 1980, when fitness kind of was invented, global obesity has doubled. Um, even more alarming to me is our mental health, anxiety stress, loneliness. Loneliness is as a, much a predictor of longevity as smoking is. It is now considered an illness. Um, eating disorders, body image issues, all on the rise. We're not getting better, and yet the fitness industry continues to rise. So that question and that confusion paralleled with my own personal feeling of struggle and failure in fitness. I was in the midst of a fitness industry. I had um, been in the fitness industry since I was 19 years old. I'm 47 now. Um, and I was doing all the things they were saying to do. I was doing the classes. I was eating nothing white ever. I was, you know, trying to, you know, the harder I worked, I thought the more calories I would burn and the skinnier I'd be and then the happier I would be. And I, I was following those formulas over and over and over again, but yet I was, my own health was declining. I was foggy headed, I was anxious, I felt heavy in both body and spirit, and I felt like I was failing fitness. It wasn't until I actually became pregnant um, that I tapped back into my roots and into what really mattered, and I realized maybe I'm not failing fitness, maybe fitness is failing me. There's something wrong with this picture. I'm not alone here. Um, what is it that's wrong with Fitness. Fitness is not broken. When we study it in a lab, it works. It does work to exercise, to improve our health, our heart health, um, to lower blood pressure, um, you know, to all these things, to lower anxiety, to all, all the things. When you build muscle, when you take your muscle to failure, that's good for you. Being strong, having joint mobility, 
um, having a good posture, being able to breathe, using your full breath, all of that when you study that in a lab works and it, it seems to be the answer to so many things. So if it's working when we study it, why isn't it working for us in real life? And I come to the conclusion, and what I know, is it's not that fitness is broken. It's that our conditioned relationship to fitness is broken. How fitness is sold to this day is the before and after picture. And I um, just want to say, I pulled this from a website that's alive and, and well today, and this was used as an advertisement to sell their fitness products and services. They, it's a fitness website that gets 30 million hits a month and is, has a 250 million annual revenue. And I just want to give a shout out. I don't know this one, but I love her. So I, I kind of had like conflict about putting her up here, but I think I want to share this story. And I thought I put like an emoji over her face and I'm like, oh, that's weird. And so I just left her face. So um, I think she's beautiful in both pictures. Um, why I wanted to share this before and after picture, because I think it's a symbol and a metaphor of what's broken in fitness. We are sold this in many different ways over and over again. The fitness industry and our society that we are born into conditions us to believe that us on the right in the happiest place on the planet, um, us to the right, there's something wrong. There's something not whole or broken or worthy. But if you do these fitness products and services in this order, like this, you're gonna become that, the after picture, right? If you really think about it, there is no presence in a before and after picture. There is an underlying message of shame in this message. For one thing, even this beautiful woman isn't that anymore because that was taken in the past, right? Um, and if she's something different than that, that's more to the picture on the right, she probably has shame about it because she's being advertised as that's where she needs to be, to be happy, to be worthy, to be successful. That's also the message we're all getting unconsciously in this message, is that we need to look like her. That's impossible, we're not her. And the fitness industry in general is sold by fitness gurus, right? And they're usually super athletes, super models, super fit people that that's what they do for a, a living. And then they share their, this is the fitness products and services I do, so you, can, you should do them too, so you can be awesome. And that sets every single one of us up for failure. And all of those measures are externally shown and externally celebrated. They're external measures of success. I know this personally. Um, so here I am. Uh, <laughs> I just still crack up at the picture. So this is, this is taken the same at the same time. Like that's this, this is the same like basically week, okay. Um, this was when at the height of my career, um, in 2014, when um, I, I had trained Madonna, which was super epic, I'll tell you that story some other day. Um, that got me on the world stage, and then I was starting this company, and I got all these like, offers, including to write a book, which I'd always wanted to do, and I signed the paper real quick. I did not, I signed away all my rights to imagery and how they were gonna market it. And I wrote a book with Prevention Magazine, and they sent me to this fancy photo shoot, and there were like stylists from New York there, and fans, and I thought I'd really made it. It was a miserable day. Um, they had me stand really weird the whole time, and there was a fan, and I was bloated, and he kept having to pull my, the stylist just kept pulling my belly in and telling me to suck in, so the whole day I could barely breathe. Um, they took a bunch of pictures. At one point, I looked over, and the creative director was expanding my butt with Photoshop and pulling it in. She was trying to figure out how to like make it more of a bump, and I saw that, and I asked her not to. So I don't think they ended up adding a butt, but she was planning on it. Um, what they did do is they erased my age. They erased, uh, you can't tell in this picture, but they turned my eyes from blue to green. They made my hair more yellow. Um, the most they took away my laugh lines. Um, but for some reason, the most disturbing part of it for me was my hands. They took away my veins. Like, they took the life out of me, honestly. Um, but I always have looked at my hands, and they remind me of my grandmother. She was like a mad smoker, and she had like claws, and they were like veiny, and she would sit there and smoke, and I just love her. And I, every time I look at my hands, I think of my grandmother, and I think of my mother, and I'm like, they took away my family in that picture, um, and who I am. And the other piece that I, I want to tell you all is like, 
sometimes you look at either of those pictures and um, think, oh, that woman has it together, right? I was the most broken I've ever been in this era, the most broken inside. I was not a picture of health. Um, there was so much going on that you don't know here. Um, first of all, I had chronic, chronic pain in my body. My low back was terribly um, painful. I was suffering from depression. I was having a really hard time focusing on my children. Um, we had some shit go down at the Bar 3 headquarters, which wasn't super fun. Um, I was having a really hard time, and then I got this image, and I just, it took me down to my knees um, because they promoted me this way. And this goes against everything I'm about. The words in the book were about honoring your truth, making it your own, looking inside for answers, believing in your intuition, and the marketing was, hello, gorgeous. 10 minutes to a tighter, firmer, sexy belly button thighs, and you barely move a muscle. You don't even have to move. This thing is so good. Um, what if I told you you could have a higher butt, slimmer, firmer thighs, and a flat, strong core? Terrible, right? We, didn't, we, we sold the book for a minute, but then I pulled it from the shelves. I was willing to take a big financial hit to uphold my core value, that this is not OK. This is not OK. Today, uh, that, was, that looks a little dated, right? It was. It was kind of a dated way of selling on top of everything. Um, today, the, the overall conditioned message with, that we're bombarded with every single day is way more nuanced and way more alarming and concerning to me. Um, and I'm going to explain it through a few different versions. Num on, on the right, there are 67.7 million posts that's the hashtag Fitspo. And you, can, you know, if you scroll through there, all those images are about um, not the fitness guru anymore, who we kind of know is photoshopped, or the Victoria's Secret model, which you kind of know is photoshopped, or the supermodel, or someone who's outside. You know that, right? You're kind of like, now it's the girl next door. Um, now it's our neighbors and everybody and ourselves taking 100 pictures with just the right angle and a little bit of a filter. So it's more nuanced. It's like, gosh, I'm really not good enough. Like, there's that underlying message every day all over. And it's not like that guilty moment when you're looking through Us Weekly at the nail salon anymore. It's in your, on your phone. You can look at it all the time now. Um, up here on the right, uh, plastic surgery uh, requests for uh, face plastic surgery to look like the selfie has in increased 55%. So here, here's an editor who did a picture of herself before with a little bit of a filter and then the Snapchat filter. People are going in and asking to look like the Snapchat filter now. Um, when I talked about my hands, uh, there is a rise in people who are getting engaged taking selfies of their hands with filters and then going to plastic surgeons and getting um, the wrinkles and Botox you know, removed from their hands so their hands look like their selfie for their engagement. Alarming, right? These are, but these are external condition, conditioned messages that we're all being written on every single day. Really important to remember that it's not the truth. Um, and then it gets even more confusing. So this one has um, 63,000 likes. She's got, I think, 3 million, um, what are they called, followers. And she's got a really empowering message. Remember that your journey is your journey and not anyone else's. Don't ever compare yourself to anyone else. Not the girl in the magazine, not the girl on Instagram, not your friends, not even me, next to that image, which objectifies the body. I mean, we can't, that's so confusing, right? That's so confusing. And it leaves you feeling a little like, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. Um, so the reason I bring up all of this is because None of us, oh wait, that's my favorite, favorite picture. I'll get to that in a second. Um, none of us can um, control those messages. They're out there right now. So it, it's a practice to, to A, notice, and be aware that those are not true. And, and we know better, right? We know better. Um, but not all before and after pictures are, are equal. I love this so much. Not only because I'm a mom, and when I saw this, my kids had just gone to school. They're uh, 13 and 15 now. Um, but this was on the Today Show, and I had to grab it because I thought it was so wonderful. Um, this is the girl's first day of school, before and after. <laughs> and you can see in the before, she's like the conditioned girl, right? Like, looking the part, just pulling it together, pulling it together for my parents so I look so cute in my uniform. 
And then she got to school, and her mom said she was really excited to see her friends after a summer away from them. And this girl had a day, right? She had a day. Even her backpack had a day. It's like exhausted. It's like, but she is just wonderful, right? Because she's resilient, she's gritty. And it's not the after. If you look at her face, she's like, I'm just beginning. Here I go, right? Um, and, and, and she's living, obviously, a life of purpose and reality and, um, and wonder. And I think we can learn so much for our children. And I, I do think there's another story to this girl that's really important to point out. She maybe didn't have the best day. I mean, it, I don't know. It kind of looks like she had a little rough and tumble fight in the playground, probably got a couple timeouts. She maybe peed herself at nap time. Um, but uh, that's kind of why we love her, right? That's why we love her. Um, and I think this is a reminder for all of us to show up and struggle. Um, and this has been a, a, a conversation um, that to talk about our struggles, um, to talk about when we suck and when we fall and we show everybody our ass in the airport, right? <laughs> um, that is um, what makes us relatable and lovable, especially when we lean into what, what is the purpose in those dark moments. There's equal purpose in dark as there is in light. And when we go through that struggle and we push right into our brave space where it's like the sand and the oyster that makes a pearl, like it's just the rub, if we can lean into that and start to talk about that more and share those stories and share those learnings, I think that we can start to let go of all those ridiculous ideals and measures of success that we're fed every single day. And we can all remember that that girl on the left is what matters. The, I drew this, this is the external forces that we're born into that make us sad that we need to practice. So at bar three, back to what I'm doing, um, I, have, um, I have decided to turn against the, the, the selling method of selling an ideal, and instead we're committed to real. And it's what we focus on every single day at bar three. When you come to our classes, all of us instructors, the reason we're successful as we are is because we're also aligned around this vision to redefine what success in fitness means. When you come to our classes, yes, we're going to build muscle. Yes, we're going to build sweat. Um, but we're going to empower you to do it your own way and to look inside for answers. Um, our mission is to teach people to be balanced in body and empowered from within. We do not expect everybody to copy the instructor. In fact, quite the opposite. If any of you guys have been to class, you know that we will celebrate when you do something different. Because when you modify a move, like if you're in plank pose and your shoulder's hurting, but that's what the instructor is saying to do, and instead you stand up and do plank at the bar, or maybe on your forearms, you're figuratively and literally standing up for yourself and what's right for your body in that moment. You're in the presence versus the after. You're not trying to chase after some ideal and getting there, which us high performers have to practice. That it's more important to work out to be present and alive and happy in our bodies as they are. Or maybe not happy, but that's okay too. Our vision is to teach, teach people to redefine what success and fitness means and to teach classes that balance the body and empower from within. But our North Star is the three in bar three. And it's a symbol of balance. But it isn't about getting to that balanced state, that ideal that we think is balanced. More importantly, every time we move in class, it's about recognizing imbalances, noticing the imbalances energetically, mentally, physically, noticing without shame or judgment, and then working towards a more balanced state. Noticing imbalances and then working towards a more balanced state. And sometimes it's noticing I don't feel awesome in my body and just notice that without judgment. That's a practice. That's way harder than doing burpees and lifting weights for many of us because, again, we're conditioned to think otherwise. One specific practice that I invite all of you to do with me, um, it's something we all do at bar three, and this applies to any kind of workout you do, even if you go around a park this big. Or you walk through a parking lot with your bags. <laughs> I love that. Uh, is whether you're at CrossFit or Yo-Yo Yogi or Burn Cycle or you're hiking or you're lifting weights or you're doing bar three, whatever exercise it is that you do, walking with your dogs around the park. Um, to before you go into the exercise, take a moment to scan your body inside and out. How do I feel? How do I feel right now? My next type. Um, I have anxiety, my head's foggy, 
you know, whatever it is. Or I'm really excited, I need to blow off steam, or I feel, I feel um, defeated today, I feel exhausted. Just notice it without judgment, and then as you work out, ask yourself, what do I need right now? What do I need right now? What do I need in this moment? What do I need in this moment? And every time you exercise, have it be a practice of being honest with yourself and what you need. Because when you do that, and I don't think this, I know this because I've been studying it since I was 19 years old on a personal level, but now I have 163 studios and online workouts in 98 countries and thousands and thousands and thousands of clients who have told me the same thing. That when you do this, exercise turns from a chore to something outside of yourself, ridden with shame, to something deeply rewarding and enriching that's yours. And that is healthy. That is healthy. And I have to tell you, some, most days I do like child's pose for 60 minutes. I don't do anything, and that's the most healthy thing I could have done. Uh, uh, there we go. Okay, so it is a practice. One of my favorite quotes I got from my friend Don Dapani, who is a um, mindfulness teacher. He was a Hindu priest for 10 years, and he's, he's a wonderful, wonderful person. Uh, he was talking to me, he said, you know, whatever it is you practice, you get good at. And I've, I've changed that to whatever it is we practice, we become. He said, Sadie, you practice being distracted all the time. You're really good at being a distracted mom. You're really good at that, right? Your daughter practices playing the piano every day. She's becoming a wonderful pianist. You know, um, you can practice uh, playing basketball. You become an incredible world-class athlete, basketball player. Whatever it is we practice, we become. And I'd like to just invite the thought that when we exercise, we can practice becoming authentic and alive in our bodies as they are. That's the practice, over and over and over again. And when we do that, those, we can shield ourselves from those negative forces and images and, and messages that are written on us from day one. But even more importantly, even this can feel lonely. Doing it alone is lonely, and we need each other to change the story. We need to change those external forces for my daughter and her daughter and whatever gender those kids identify with in the future. For future generations, I believe this is a collective work we need to do together to change the message. And when we do that, we can build a circle around us as we are right here in circles upon circles upon circles. Um, and I really believe that once we've built a circle around this idea of practicing becoming authentic and happy in our bodies as they are when it comes to fitness, but this also applies to business, it applies to everything. It applies to being human, right? If we practice struggling and being honest about it, then we practice as a, as a society being honest with struggle and letting it out. So it's a real thing like we've all been talking about. And when we do that, we can change the message and we can send positive energy and that will exponentially grow and grow and grow and grow. I really do believe in circles, sitting shoulder to shoulder um, with people just as we are today. Um, I grew up in circle um, with an amazing group of women. I know the power of women supporting women, humans supporting humans. Um, and I really encourage all of you um, to initiate circles in your life. Um, they're all over the place, sitting in a hot tub, sitting at dinner, team huddles. Um, if you think book club, uh, if you think of all the times you come together, see if you can ignite a conversation around this with your circle so that um, together, collectively, we can all practice becoming more authentic, more alive, and more honest, because that truly is success. Thank you.